<clears throat> I feel bad because some of you were undoubtedly uh, at Rotary today, and I don't want to repeat myself. But what I plan to do is to talk for about 30 minutes uh, and then uh, open it up for questions, because that, that's where I'll learn the most. So I'm going to let you learn something, hopefully, for 30 minutes, but then I'll learn when I, when I, when I hear your questions. I, I have to put this in context. I'm a neurologist in training, okay, uh, with no formal school. I'm a homeschool neurologist. <laughs> I spent 40 years in the United States Army. I was a tanker. Uh, I, I got to say, I deployed with the 39th uh, in 2004 and 2005. Uh, uh, Edwards was just a lawyer back then. <laughs> and we usually put an expletive deletive in the front of that. Uh, but Ron Chastain and the rest of my friends here from the 39th, um, we deployed uh, into um, Iraq for 12 months. I came home for about seven months more and then went back for another 12 months as the Corps commander. Uh, I did not know what traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress was. I, I knew that what my football coach had told me about traumatic brain injury is when you got bopped in the head, you just shook it off and got back in the game, everything would be okay. I, somebody had taught me about combat stress, and I knew I had combat stress teams that were assigned. And when we had bad days uh, in Iraq, like we did on um, April 12th, when that rocket came screaming in uh, when your guys were doing everything right. Um, I would send those combat stress teams out, but I really didn't know what it was for but to, to help people who were under stress. It wasn't until I became Vice Chief of Staff of the Army uh, in 2008, I inherited a huge organization fighting two wars, um, a 1.1 million soldiers, um, when you had active and reserve component, and uh, a $242 billion budget. And I was the vice chief of staff, and for those of you who know what that is, that's kind of the COO of the organization. You stay in the Pentagon and go to all the meetings the chief doesn't want to go. He goes around pontificating and coming up with things that he tells you you got to put in place and then gets mad at you when you don't have them in place in a very short period of time. And on the fourth day I was vice, uh, and this is hopefully this is the only part, part I will repeat. Um, medical command came in, and um, I had always been around Army docs, but now I had inherited and was responsible for one of the largest medical systems in, in the country. And it was fighting in two wars. It was evacuating kids within 72 hours who, from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan back to Walter Reed. I saw kids uh, when I was vice 56 hours after they were injured on the battlefield. We had hospitals all over those two countries, plus a huge operation in Landstuhl, uh, and all over the nation. Um, and I inherited this thing, and they came in and they showed me a single slide, which quite frankly changed my life. It showed at that time of 3,500 soldiers with a single VA disqualifying injury of 30% or greater. I thought for sure the longest bar uh, on the chart all the way over to the left it was, as it was laid out was going to be for those who lost arms or legs or multiple limbs. But the fact of the matter is it started with 2% of that 3,500 person population um, had, in, had a um, serious burn, 4% had spinal cord injury, 10% had lost an arm or a leg. And when I added the two bars to the far left, the biggest bars, it was 36% had traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress and I didn't even know what they were. Um, to flash forward, I was pretty miserable at my job because I focused on this for four years, and when I left, the number of wounded soldiers was now 11,000, and 67% had traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. So by far, they are the most prolific wounds coming out of this war. And there's some of you who are sitting there saying, yeah, but that's something the matter with this generation because why do we have so much of this? I, th I think there's a bunch of reasons. Number one, we never recognized it before. <clears throat> I invite you to watch War Torn, uh, 1861 to 2010, if you want to see a great HBO special that goes back and traces a Civil War soldier, because what did Civil War soldiers do? They wrote letters home. And it's a soldier named Alexander Crapsey. He was a, an Italian, Italian descent. He lived in Pennsylvania. He joined the war, uh, ready to fight for his nation. Um, uh, and uh, his letters 
talked of that. And then a letter came home that talked about a first sergeant that committed suicide. And from there on, what the documentary does is it progresses what was happening to this young soldier. He was finally booted out of the Union Army and sent home two and a half years after he joined. He came back home. The war ended. He was on a hunting trip with one of his friends. He stopped on a trail and blew his brains out. But the most poignant part in this movie, in this thing, this documentary, to me, was the World War II soldiers. Um, about 14 of them that they interviewed. And, and my father uh, was a meat cutter before the war, a meat cutter after the war, but he spent four and a half years uh, in uh, North Africa, Sicily, and all throughout Europe, and I could never get him to tell me those stories. And seeing these 14 or 12 or 14 individuals interviewed who talked about what it was like to come back at that time with what they used to call operational exhaustion or battle fatigue. First it was battle fatigue in the Korean War, it was operational exhaustion, and it was finally in 1972 we adopted post-traumatic stress um, for the Vietnam War vets. It was, um, it, it, it was amazing to hear these 12 men talk about how they did not want to come home and admit to anybody that they were having the problems that they had. And they lived with this until the filming of this documentary. And we all remember Audie Murphy as the most decorated soldier in World War II, and him being in movies. What we forget is Audie Murphy um, had battle fatigue, and he got hooked on a pill, sleeping pill called Percodil. Um, he had some discipline. He locked himself in a hotel room in Denton, Texas, and he spent the rest of his life going around trying to go to veterans groups, telling veterans, from World War II to go get help that they needed. This is a huge issue. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, I really believe what's happening today is that some of the stigma associated with it has gone away. We're talking about it more. We're hearing about it more. Uh, and, and that's absolutely essential to fixing the problem. So when I um, got frustrated in my four years as vice, and I realized that we didn't know, we were about 40 to 50 years behind in understanding the brain as opposed to the other body organs we have, when I had the opportunity in retirement to go to work for One Mind, which is an organization, my elevator speech is what we're trying to do is to become the American Heart Association for all the diseases of the brain. Because what research is leading us today and I think this is important to understand, it's the silos that we've put up around these diseases where we think that they're all separate, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, you name it, are slowly breaking down. I, I think kind of like Agent Orange, the real story here is going to be 10 to 12 years from now. Uh, the VA is already seeing it um, with soldiers with traumatic brain injury or having early onset Parkinson's. And, and there's a lot of research that's showing the connection between traumatic brain injury, dementia, post-traumatic stress, um, Parkinson's, ALS, uh, and some have even made a connection uh, to MS um, uh, and autism. So we're starting to break down these silos and understand that as we're studying one, we may be unlocking the secret from the other. Um, now, that's the soldier story. That's what brought me into this. And the organization I work for decided that it was going to concentrate to start with, because you can't boil the ocean, there's over 400 of these diseases, was going to start on traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. And that's what appealed to me, based on the four years I spent it as vice. But since I've come to here, what I've come to find out is the military problem is just a speck of sand on the beach compared to the overall problem here. Um, CDC briefed me the other day that uh, their new figures for tra traumatic brain injury uh, in this country is 3.4 million a year. 3.4 million, and it's kind of apropos to be here at the Clinton School and realize what happened to Hillary Clinton. Um, that's classic head trauma that occurs because of a fall. Uh, and one of the reasons for the increase is um, we're living longer. And in living longer, my biggest fear with my mom, who has dementia, uh, isn't that she's going to forget my name, although that'll be a traumatic time for me, but it's quite frankly the fact that she'll probably fall. 
Um, and, and that's where head trauma, and we know that if you have one TBI, you're more likely to have another TBI. Mo that's 3.4 million, and, and that's a $78 billion in direct health, health care costs. To give you a, a number for Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's is over 200 billion a year in this country today, and um, it, it is projected in 25 years to be a trillion dollars a year. We in this country spend a trillion dollars a year on the diseases and injuries of the brain. A trillion dollars a year, and Europe does the same thing. Uh, and those numbers are only going up. And, and, and that is far greater than the direct health care costs for cancer or heart disease. I know that's hard to believe. Traumatic brain injury is one of the leading causes of death and injury in this country. So this has taken on a whole new perspective for me. Uh, post-traumatic stress, as I was explaining today, when you go back and look and try to understand post-traumatic stress and what happens to the brain when it occurs, um, you realize that most of the research that's been done has been on women who are sexually assaulted. Um, and that's why I only say post-traumatic stress. It's not necessarily just because of soldiers, it's because of women. I cannot imagine telling a woman who has been sexually assaulted and has a reaction to a sexual assault that she has a disorder. To me, that's not a disorder. That's a reaction from an injury that she suffered. Um, and I think I'm the only four-star in the Army that I'm told has the support of Gloria Steinem when I made that argument in front of the, the APA last year as they were trying to decide in DSM-5 whether they were going to drop the D or not in post-traumatic stress. Um, so, so this is a huge, huge problem. The silos are breaking down. So what are we trying to do? We are trying to fund major research, longitudinal study in traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress that's about a $45 million project. It's uh, a public-private partnership we're putting together. We're going after all the government money we can get. Uh, and NIH has put up $19.7 million, but this is the part that really bothers me, and I said this to the Rotary, but I've got to repeat it, because those of you who are businessmen, this will resonate with you. You have a $78 billion, billion problem, and your R&D budget to fix it is $84 million, and that's what we spent on traumatic brain injury research last year. Uh, and you were the CEO of a company and had a $78 billion problem and you're spending $84 million to solve it, guess what? You wouldn't be the CEO for very long. Um, and, and that's what we're doing. We spent $84 million. Now, I can get really on my soapbox and say, tell me you're really taking care of soldiers. Are these are the most prolific wounds coming out of this war right now, and you're only spending $84 million out of a $31 billion budget Tell me again how, how you're taking care of soldiers. Sailors, airmen, Marines, men and women who've done nothing but what their country have asked them to do as all volunteers for the first time ever in the last 13 years. So what we're trying to do is get as much of that money as government can get. And NIH has put out uh, what they call an RFA for, and we help craft the RFA for a longitudinal study of traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress, where we will enroll at time of injury three to 5,000 patients, and we will do full phenotyping, patient history, pull their blood, do CT scans, which is the current gold standard for, um, and it's not a very good gold standard for traumatic brain injury, and MRIs at the time of injury, six weeks, three months, <clears throat> uh, six months, nine months, 12 months, and then we'll go into the second and third year and we're still deciding what the protocol will be and that probably won't be decided whether or not it's every six months or every three months. But in order to do that, that's $8,000 a patient. Now here, here's the first lesson I ran into in this. We kind of laid this out and said in order to get the database that the pharmaceutical companies, which I'll, I'll just throw this out here, have basically pulled out of neurology right now, they are not doing things in neuroscience right now because the risk is too high and they're all companies who've decided, hey, listen, <laughs> you know, billions of dollars to develop a drug. We don't even know if the drug will come to market. We know, many times don't know to the 17th year. Even if we have success in the 17th year, we've got three to five years to, to recoup our investment and we can't do it before the drug goes generic. So they didn't tell any of us, but they pulled out of this area. Like a dummy, I thought all the drugs were being prescribed for my soldiers when I was studying suicides in, in, in the Army 
for the four years trying to lower the rate of it. I thought all the drugs for post-traumatic stress were drugs that had been brought to market for post-traumatic stress. Not a single one has been. They're all 40 to 50 year old antidepressants that are being repurposed in what I think the medical profession calls an off-label prescription where a doctor makes an evaluation that this antidepressant will in fact help this person with the problem they have. And, and that's perfectly fine. And many times they do, many times they do absolutely nothing, and sometimes they end in tragedy. So, the NIH has put up $19.7 million. So I thought, great, we're going to have 19.7 of the 45 we need. And then somebody said, no, sir, not so fast. Because when the NIH gives somebody $19.7 million, they take 52 cents on the dollar for all the institutions for what you call indirect costs. Okay? Some, they're higher. But so you get 52 cents on every dollar, which brings it down to about 3.5 million a year for three to five years we'll get from the NIH. We, that gives you about $2,200 a patient. And as I explained today uh, at the Rotary Club, well, you were watching the Super Bowl, and I was supposed to experience my first Super Bowl, not in the Army, not being in Iraq when my beloved Seahawks went to the Super Bowl in 2006, and I was in Baghdad. Um, this time, uh, for my very first one as a civilian, I spent it uh, in a Marriott at the Houston airport with a bunch of neuroscientists trying to put together a grant application to win this 19.7. And they'd done the entire division. They had heard from the CDC the 27 different de definitions, the absolute criticality. We have a robust database. Yet all they were doing is what researchers in this country do, which is a huge issue, is they were looking at the amount that the NIH was going to do, what the NIH was asking them to do, and trying to convince the NIH that they were the best people to get that grant, okay, so they can keep their labs going. And it's... That's the way we do research. I'm not saying it's good, bad, or I'm just saying that's the way we did it. So they had $2,200 per patient, and they were trying to come up with a protocol to decide who are they going to give MRIs to, and they, because they realized they could only give MRIs to 600 of the 3,000 patients based on the amount of money they had. And I sat and listened to them put together this protocol. If, if one of you were to fall today and you're taken to the hospital here, they're going to give you a test for traumatic, for, 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 for head trauma called Glasgow coma. It's a cognitive test. They're going to ask you some questions. You're going to get a point count. And based on that point count, that number, they're going to tell you you have mild, moderate, or severe. What we found out in the first 652 patients we entered is we told a whole bunch of people at time of injury they had severe traumatic brain injury who did not miss a day of work. We had very difficult time following them up because they had severe traumatic brain injury, but they left the clinic that night went home, had no more problem, and when we tried to get them back in, they said, well, I don't want to come back into the doctor. I'm not having any problem with my head. The ones that came back in, in many cases, were those that we told they had mild traumatic brain injury, who had huge cognitive issues that were getting worse, and quite frankly, were progressing. They, 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 they all wanted to come in. So we don't even have a good test for patient outcome to know how bad you're hurt. So I'm sitting here listening to these doctors come up with a protocol of which 600 people, and I finally, being a homeschooled neurologist, jumped up and said, guys, isn't the right answer that we give a MRI to every single one of these people since we really don't know which ones are going to do well and which ones are going to do good at time of injury? And they said, well, of course, General, but the fact of the matter is we only have 2200 bucks, so we can't do that. So what I told them to do was put together the protocol of the things that they needed, and guess what? It worked out to be the $8,000 per patient that we knew from the beginning we needed. So my job now is to come up with the delta, and that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to come up with a delta, and I've received a, a rather large matching grant from the Wounded Warrior Project. Those of you who travel on airplanes know the Wounded Warrior Project's all around. Um, they are probably the most successful veteran service organization coming out of the war. Um, they started with amputees because most of their posters will show an amputee on it, but now they've started a new campaign where they're showing a soldier who looks like a soldier and saying, these are the hidden wounds of war. And they provided us a large matching grant pending us winning the NIH grant. 
Um, that allows them to go to their board and say, see, this is, they competed, they won, and, and I'm going out to people like General Electric, the National Football League, a whole bunch of other big businesses, private donors and other people to come up with this delta. So at the end, we have a database that's the best ever. But we're not stopping there. The other thing I found out when we do research is when you get that grant, um, one of the things that was passed in 1980, um, and it was probably right in 1980, was a law called Bayh-Dole. And Bayh-Dole basically says that if the United States government gives taxpayers dollars to a, the University of Arkansas, well, I'll pick on my school, I won't pick on yours, okay? But yours is the same. The University of Washington to do a grant and th that researcher collects data, that data and the intellectual property connected with that data belong not to the government, but it belongs to that individual in the university. And universities, I promise you've got them, we've got them, have got huge organizations filled with John Edwards kind of people, lawyers who work the IP issues, okay? And what I'm finding is I'll probably get the money I need. It's, it's a stretch, but I'll probably get the money I need. The hard part is going to be convincing the 11 institutions that make up our consortium to share that data. And what we're basically saying is no more of this data hogging. This problem is too hard. We need all the best minds in the country looking at this. So we've created an information portal that we call Apollo, where all that data will be stored. We will give exclusivity to the data to our researchers on a rolling basis for six months so they can look at it, clean it up, make sure it's good, and, you know, maybe rush to do an article or whatever. You know, but at the end of that six months, that data is posted onto our portal, and whether you participated with us or not, it's available to all researchers. All researchers are doing traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, all those related diseases. With the goal of this portal really being the thing that begins to change the way we do begin to do research in this country. Now, I'm not saying that you take all that intellectual property away from universities, you take it all away from the individuals, but we need to sit down and come up with a business model that's different than the one we have today. Because what has changed today when you understand the brain is we now have the ability, the ability, the computing ability and the analytic capability with what has happened with computers like Watson, okay, and the cloud to take massive amounts of data that are today unconnected and not known and be able to analyze that data. I guess what I'm saying is the answer may already be out there. It may be locked in 50 different labs across the country that have found out things that have data, and if we could combine that data, the power of that would be huge. And that's what you're going to need to do to, in fact, be able to solve this problem. Let me see if I can get this to work. I won't worry about it. I'll stop by saying the kind of a defining moment to me is when I went to New Orleans to go to the Society for Neuroscience. And for those of you who are doctors, I got invited to go to a poster show. Uh, and I've got a picture in here someplace that shows that post poster show. Um, and, and anyways, what it is is the New Orleans Convention Center that's filled up with a bunch of boards that are four feet by eight feet, where 20,000 posters roll in on the morning, each one of the posters has got the results of some lab doing something, someplace, all in the field of neuroscience, okay? They stay in there for five hours and they're changed out a total of eight times uh, in four days. There's a morning session, an afternoon session, and they change out 10,000 posters, 20,000 each day for a total of four days. When you walk in there, there's a picture that says no, photograph, no, no photographs allowed because all that data is the proprietary data of all those labs. If you could connect all that data that's found in the New Orleans Convention Center over a four-day period, doing what we do with Google and other forms of you know, connectivity today, no telling what you would find out. So 
I guess what I'm telling you is this just isn't about trying to fund major research. It's also trying to come up with change a policy model, change policy in this country and how we do basic research in this country and try to bridge the translational gap that they is often referred to as from bench to bedside. In the middle is this translational science and how you take it from the animal model to the human being. Um, if you want to have brain injury today, it's probably best to be a rat. Because we, we've cured a lot of it in rats, but what we're finding out with the brain, because the brain is so complicated, and I asked this question at, at our summit the other day, some of the animal modeling we've done that has been so, so successful in helping us understand the rest of the human body doesn't necessarily work out when you translate that to the human, because the brain this thing that makes us who we are is so much more complicated than any other organ in our body. And I will stop there right at 30 minutes and open it up for questions. All right. Anybody uh, have questions? If you do, raise your hands. We'll get the microphone to you. Yes, sir. Microphone coming right. Wait for the microphone, please. How is DSM-5 going to handle uh, a traumatic stress disorder? So, can you say the question again, sir? Hold the microphone up close to you. Uh, how is DSM-5, the Diagnostic Statistic, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, that's coming out, I think, tomorrow? How's, how's it going to handle? It's going to call it post-traumatic stress disorder. I lost my argument. I went up there and made an argument based on um, really what our allies have done. I don't know how, much, how many of you know, but we, we, when we were with the 39th, we fought with the Brits. And I don't know about how many of you know about British military tradition. In the British military, it is somewhat of a dishonor to be wounded in battle. That's why they wore red coats, to hide the blood. Okay? There is no Purple Heart in the British Army. None. Um, and the Canadians come from the same tradition. The Canadians who fought so valiantly with us both in Iraq, but in particularly in Afghanistan, saw the difference um, as we were starting to beat down the stigma and realized they had a huge problem because the tradition in their army forever had been uh, you're letting down your unit if you get wounded. They instituted something called the wound stripe that took the place of the, that, that was like their purple heart and they went one step further than us that in soldiers who suffered what we call post-traumatic stress, they changed the name to operational stress injury. And they saw a huge increase in the number of soldiers, Canadian soldiers, that came in to get treatment. And kind of to prove the point I'm trying to make is, is if you were to have a Brit in here today, a British senior officer, and you were saying, well, what's your situation with post-traumatic stress in Great Britain? And they'd say, oh, no, we, we, we don't have a lot of that. We, we just don't understand why you guys have that problem as greatly as you do. Now, we have a huge problem with alcoholism. Our guys are coming home and, and getting drunk all the time. And, and the judge and I were talking today that the, the number of, 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 the, of the alcohol abusers that you see today is undiagnosed post-traumatic stress. And really what I was trying to do with the APA was say, listen, that D is a barrier to care. No 19-year-old wants to go in and be told, you have a disorder. Even with HIPAA, um, he or she is worried in the job environment we are today that having that disorder label placed on them. Now, some do. There's no doubt that some come in and get treatment. But what I'm saying is there's a huge group of untreated people out there that I saw in the Army all the time that were using alcohol and prescription drugs to self-medicate because they did not want to be told that they had a disorder. And that's the argument I was making. And I think that's what the Canadians attacked. And I think that's what the Brits are missing, is they've got a lot of post-traumatic stress. The fact of the matter is, um, rather than going and get help or cognitive therapy or other things, their guys are coming back and drinking. And they don't have a VA system either. They have no VA system. They, they become part of the British medical system, which makes it even more difficult. And, and, you know, if, if you're a National Guard soldier in Arkansas, you've gone to your employer, you've told your employer, I've got to be off for 12 months, 15 months, 18 months in order to be trained up and deployed. You come back home, you're having the kind of problems associated with post-traumatic stress. 
Are you going to now go tell your employer when you're working in rural Arkansas that I got to drive two hours to come and get treatment and get a day off every single week? And, 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 and you're worried about holding your job? That's why you have these, in my opinion, large percentage of undiagnosed folks. All right. Yes, now, yeah. the DSM is not going to drop it. But you know, the NIMH has said they're no longer going to follow DSM-5. They've basically thrown it out. There's a great article in the Wall Street Journal this Saturday, and it, it's a huge issue right now. Uh, and what they're really upset about is that the NIMH made this announcement two weeks before DSM-5 came out. They basically said, hey, listen, we got to go, we got to do better than asking somebody 14 questions and making a determination whether they have post-traumatic stress. Yes, sir, got a question right here. Thank you. I'm working on a writing project dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder from weather-related disasters. And the question I have dealing with what you're referencing is, have y'all identified triggers and what sorts of triggers are you working with? And also, too, is there a correlation between PTSD and, like, spousal abuse? Or one thing that I'm concerned about is rural cops who are veterans who have undiagnosed PTSD, and it impacts how they enforce the law and sometimes even lie to justify the cop abuse they have. Uh, I've been wanting to make the argument or get somebody to do the research on the increase of sexual assaults that we've seen in the United States military, um, and I'm not in any way going to say that this is why we've seen an increase. I would just say that I believe a contributing factor to that increase is post-traumatic stress, because one of the, the DSM-4 questions you ask, one of the things we see in people with post-traumatic stress is partner aggression. You, you, you see that occur. You know. There's two groups of people out there. There's the kind of people who aren't prone to these things and say, you know, that's a weakness that these people have and they just need to buck it up. And then there's the others that are suffering from it. And there may be an answer to this, this whole issue because more and more of the work is showing there's a genetic component here. I was explaining to some folks earlier today, a little five foot woman can get bonked on the head on the exact same spot that a male that's six foot five get bonked. And guess what? The five foot tall woman does not have a concussion, she's fine, thank you very much, where the six foot five guy who gets bonked because of genetic makeup, okay, he has a concussion. We, we, for 20 years, we've known about a protein called APOE4. And APOE4, if you get it from both your mother or your father, simple blood test, um, I hate to tell you, you're at a higher risk for, for Alzheimer's disease. They, they've known that for a long period of time, okay? Uh, we've never taken it to where it needs to be. We need to, that's one of the reasons we're doing what we're doing. We'll have 3,000 patients with traumatic brain injury, and we'll know, you know, what, 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 do they have, did they get APO4 from their, APOE4 from their mother and their father? Um, so there's a genetic makeup to this whole thing um, that, it, that is huge. And, and with the imaging techniques that we have today, using PET ligands and uh, positron emission tomography, we're able to, to, to image the brain in ways that we were never able to image before. That's why we could take on traumatic brain injury in the Army before we could take on post-traumatic stress. Because using positron emission tomography, uh, it, did anybody see the 60 Minutes two weeks ago with Ben Richards? And they, you know, th that was a real no kin story in there. It was called the AHA slide that Dr. David Hovda brought me when I was vice and brought to Jim Amos, who was, when he showed us that slide of the three brains, one normal brain using positron emission tomography, and it's pretty easy. Brain is 2% of your body mass, burns 20% of the energy your body creates. And if you pump somebody full of, of sugar you, using a radiological PET ligand dye, take a picture of their brain using positron emission tomography, in a normal brain it's going to be all reds and yellows because that brain is burning that energy. The next picture he showed me was an individual who was concussed and in a coma for five days, had never even woken up from the coma. They were in a car accident. Their brain, colors, using the same technique, was all dark blues and purples. The next one was a UCLA football player that at two minutes and 46 seconds in a game, it got a bonk to the head. He was pulled out of the game, taken to the locker room at halftime, cleared to go out and play the second half. Went out and played the second half, and as he was dressed out that night, one of the trainers said, hey, you know, you really took a big blow to the head, and sometimes the Symptoms of a concussion don't show up till 24 hours after the fact. 
If you experience any of these things the next day, come on in to the emergency room and, and, and they'll check you out. You know the rest of the story. He did. They took a picture of his brain using positron emission tomography. And if I was to show you those two and ask you which one is the individual that's been comatose for five days and never woke up, has not talked to Dr. One, and which is the one who wandered in the emergency room and said, Doc, I'm experiencing the same symptoms, you can't tell the difference. And that's the problem we were having in Iraq and Afghanistan. We were having kids that would go out, they would get hit, and I think everybody agrees that if you receive a second concussion, a second blow to the head before the first one, the brain has had an opportunity to recover from the first, that's when you get the, the you know, increased um, cognitive deficit that can be long-lasting. Yes, sir. Question right here. Wait for the microphones coming behind you. Yes, sir. Why are institutions reluctant to share their data? Because in some instances, they think they can make a lot of money over the data. In some instances, it's the academic system we have. That data allows me to write the journal refereed article that allows me to be... The, <clears throat> academia has a... You see, everything in academia is the opposite of the way it was in the military. We were talking beforehand with my buddies here, and I said, you know, if I had information that I did not provide you, the 39th, when I was a division commander at the speed of light, and one of your soldiers was injured, the weight of Arkansas would come down on the division commander of the 1st Cavalry Division. I sat in a meeting with a bunch of doctors, and one of them knew me, and they were doing the obligatory round table, let's introduce. And one of them had helped me put together the protocol along with Jim Amos that we put in place for traumatic brain injury downrange. And when it got to him, he says, I know General Corelli very, very well. General Corelli and I work together in putting together the protocol, blah, 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 blah. He'll be very excited to know that we have some research that's going to be published five months from now that will show a currently prescribed drug for traumatic brain injury does no good whatsoever. In some instances, will do more harm than good. And I looked at him and I said his name. I said, oh, Pete, what is the drug? He looked at me and he says, I can't tell you. I said, what do you mean you can't tell me? I can't tell you because Lancet won't publish my article if it gets out that this particular, you know, before they publish it in, in my journal article. Now, we have 24, and I've left some folders up there for you, any of you who are interested in knowing a little bit more about one mind. We have 24 of the most unbelievable neuroscientists who are on our scientific advisory board. You're not betting on Pete Corelli here when it comes to the science. We've got some really smart people who are, who are looking at this. And I went to a meeting with them, and I lamented that story, wanting to have some kind of sympathy, okay? And I told that story. I looked at them. They all just kind of looked like, you know, what are you talking about? And finally, one of the heads of one of the NIH institutes, the 26 institutes of the NIH, and we have three of them on our scientific advisory board, raised their hand and said, General, you're worried about a five-month delay? Even after that article is published, studies have shown it will take 10, 8 to 12 years to permeate the field. They'll still be prescribing this drug because we don't have a way, okay, of necessarily promulgating that information in the medical field the way we do um, in, in the rest. 27% of the doctors in this country use the internet as part of their practice. Yet, we signed up a billion Facebook users in what, eight years? And, and, and a year and a half from now, the first doctor will graduate from medical school that has never lived in a world without the internet. And that's one of the things that's kind of playing in my favor here. The world is starting to change, and, and young folks who understand the power of information, the ability to, to, to use that information are coming up through the ranks, and I think they're going to change medicine in this country. Question right here at the back. Hello, sir. I wish to applaud you for your efforts in, in taking on this monumentous um, task. Uh, I guess my question would be almost a very, very simple, too simple. 
you spoke of the money and the millions of dollars that are going towards research in the pharmaceutical realms, in the statistics and the information sharing. And I would ask you how much of that money is going for information sharing to the, to, to have an education program for the people that are concussed and then just walk away. How do they know what these first symptoms are? Um, what's the education system, the primary prevention, I guess, once they've been hit? And then the second part of that question is, how much of this money has gone for the actual patient care portion? It seems like we're talking about all this research, but then when you talk to the actual soldiers themselves, they find it very hard to get menial care or for someone to listen to them or get into a shrink or someone of that nature for the PTSD side of it. Well, first of all, uh, if you're looking at post-traumatic stress, we have a huge, you know, that, that's one area where we've had some success with cognitive therapy. Um, and cognitive therapy has proven to be in about, I've seen studies that show between 75, 70, 70 to 75 percent of the time is very, very effective. But cognitive therapy is very, very time consuming. And it takes time to do it the right way. And what we have is a shortage of behavioral health care specialists in this country. So what I found in the Army was when you're given a shortage and you have a system that works on hospitals and doctors work on a thing called a relative value unit, you know, if, if, if an old man like me goes in and I've just had my blood test and the doc says you got high cholesterol, I go to one doctor and that doctor spends 20 minutes because he basically has an amount of time to clear me out of his office using an RVU. I'm not saying he's going to stop mid-sentence and kick you out of 20 minutes, but I'm saying they have guidelines Okay, because I learned this running a big medical institution. They have guidelines of how long they're supposed to see everybody based on the problem that they've got. Not to say that sometimes they don't see you for longer. But if you have a doctor who says, okay, Corelli, you've all of a sudden got high cholesterol. You've never had it before. Maybe, you, what are you doing differently? Well, doc, I'm on a plane all the time. I'm not exercising. I'm not eating right, so on and so forth. He says, okay, let's try some lifestyle, cha lifestyle changes before we do anything here. And he takes the whole 20 minutes talking to me about that where you have another doctor who comes in and says, Corelli, you got high blood pressure, here, take Lipitor. You're out of here, okay? Now, I'm, I'm doing this for effect, but I found out in my army, and I found out paying the TRICARE bill, that the doctor who spends two minutes with you writes a prescription for Lipitor, as opposed to the doctor who spends 20 minutes with you explaining to you how you should do lifestyle changes. Not only I wouldn't draw a of what's good and what's bad, I'm saying the one that spends two minutes and writes a prescription gets more money for that visit than the one, at least in TRICARE they did, than the one that spends 20 minutes, the whole 20 minutes, talking to you about lifestyle changes. Now, that, and, but, but we have a real problem when it comes in the Army to being able to do cognitive therapy on everybody with post-traumatic stress. And you have a huge problem in doing cognitive therapy. That's with an active component force, but when you have a reserve component force, you know, where does a soldier from the 39th that moves to rural Arkansas, where does he or she go to get cognitive therapy? Is it available? Is it known? I, I don't know. But then again, the time it's going to take to do that is going to even be greater. And it goes back to the point I'm making before. Now, there, there's people who are going to tell you for traumatic brain injury that they've got the answer. Well, there's nothing FDA approved right now. There are some drugs that are prescribed. But basically, with traumatic brain injury, it's go home, rest, and tell us how you're doing. Deep brain stimulation is showing some promise. There's some drugs that are supposedly coming down. There's many who argue about omega-3s and other things you can do. But boy, we just don't know, and I'm willing to be corrected by anybody in here, we don't know a lot of what to do with someone who has cognitive issues associated with traumatic brain injury. General, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, what a great program, and, and we're glad to have you. Let's, let's give the general a round of applause. Thank you.